You know, I'm not going to lie, despite their more controversial design aesthetic, the new M1 iMacs actually look pretty fly, and I recently pre-ordered two of them last Friday, a baseline and a spec'd out model to review and compare for future coverage on this channel, when they finally ship that is, and I also just bought an M1 Mac Mini for the same coverage reasons. And though I didn't cover it right when it came out, I gotta say, from my brief time using it, for the price, the hardware, and the I.O., this thing is actually pretty amazing. I say this because unlike the MacBook Air, it has all eight GPU cores and is actively cooled with an internal fan, eliminating most, if not all, instances of thermal throttling. This means you're getting maximum performance at all times, and that makes sense because this thing is a desktop after all. And once again, this thing is relatively affordable for a brand new Mac with brand new M1 Apple Silicon hardware. I for one just bought this from Best Buy for 741 after taxes, and I should have bought it off of Apple's website refurbished for $589 without taxes, but still though, it's a crazy value considering all the power you get and the fact that you can configure this up to you know 16 gigs of unified memory under $1,000, which is great for 4K video content creators like me or anyone who needs really high level performance. I also mentioned IO. This is the only M1 Mac equipped with USB type A ports, an ethernet port, and an HDMI port for video output. In short, the M1 Mac Mini brings the awesome power of Apple Silicon with its well-established bring your own peripherals versatility, all for a great price or value. And with that said, I'd also argue that the M1 iMac is a great value as well, considering all the hardware that you get with it. Luke Miani recently touched on the fact that if you built a similarly spec computer setup, it would come to around $1,200 plus, especially factoring in the new 500 nit 4.5K display that's built in. So what exactly is the point of this video? Well, I've yet to get my M1 iMac units in hand, so I'm gonna stop talking about them until then, and instead address viewers that might want one, but simply cannot buy one at the moment. So if you want the aesthetic and the power of the M1 iMac, but simply can't or don't want to stomach its price tag, I think I have a setup solution for you. Now, word of warning, it's centered around a peripheral that is as old as some seniors in high school right now, uh, but I think it's aged really well like the mom from Big Hero 6, or the dad from Inside Out, or dare I say, like Craig Federico, okay, I'm gonna stop, this is, this is so bad. This, my friends, is a 2004 aluminum Apple Cinema display. It's a little thick, sure, and the resolution isn't anything stellar, but my God, I think this thing is so pretty. I am 100% convinced it played a role in the design ideation behind the new IMAX. I mean, just look at the hinge circle thing, whatever it's called. The aluminum design is just so classic and premium. In order to shoot this video, I had to lug this thing to my apartment in the backseat of my car the other day. And usually when I'm like transporting a monitor like this, I'm like worried it's gonna break in this environment, but not this thing though. It is an absolute unit, like a tank with the way it's built. Something else notable about this monitor is that it has capacitive power and brightness buttons on the right side. And speaking of the sides, they are crafted out of white plastic, which I think adds really nice contrast to its overall look. You also have ancient USB-A 2.0 and FireWare ports on the back. You can just ignore those because they're going to be of absolutely no use to you. Uh, you obviously can't hook up to FireWire anymore, and the USB ports don't work as far as I've tried. And like I said, resolution-wise, these cinema displays are a bit dated. 100 PPI is standard across the board with these panels, which is actually kind of average nowadays if you think about it. I mean, most people aren't using 2.5K plus displays, so if you're not and you want one of these, you shouldn't have an issue using it at all. I for one use 4K displays all the time and didn't struggle much adjusting my eyes. Again, it's not ideal, but considering how much I love this monitor and how it looks, I could live with it, albeit for more casual activities. Something else worth noting is that this display that I've had and I'm currently using is a 20 inch unit. I would highly recommend using a 23 inch unit for the best, most iMac like experience, although there is a gigantic 30 inch unit if you're into that as well. Nonetheless, I have it fixed on top of my M1 Mac Mini here. It works really well because this machine is only available in silver and is perfectly color matched to the monitor. It also elevates the display closer to eye level, an issue people have had with Apple monitors and iMacs alike in the past and present. In order to get this up and running, however, you do need an DVI female to USB-C or HDMI male adapter. I'll leave a link in the video description to one I recently bought off Amazon for this setup. It's around $12 to $14 last time I checked. And yeah, I think it works really well. 
Keep in mind these displays were some of the best money could buy back in the early 2000s, and while resolution is nothing to gawk at nowadays, in terms of color, contrast, and brightness, these displays are not bad at all. Like I've said, I've definitely used better, but I wouldn't be crying if I was forced to use a panel like this. As I've continued to say, I think this monitor is a piece of art and complements the new IMAX quite nicely, and if you're looking for this kind of aesthetic on a budget, this is not a bad option in the slightest. And if you're wondering where to find one of these panels, your best bet is going on a site like Craigslist or eBay. You know, you have to buy one use at this point. They were discontinued in like 2006 or seven, I think. Uh, pricing definitely varies depending on condition and some are in rougher shape. So avoid units that have scratch displays or really scratch chassis. Also something to keep in mind, uh, these displays are sometimes sold separately from the power adapters. So be prepared to find a listing that include both or you might have to buy the power adapter separately. And from what I've seen for the 23 inch model that I personally recommend that you pick up in decent condition with the power adapter, you're gonna be paying anywhere from 175 to 225 with shipping sometimes, although I see a lot of listings with free shipping. Also too, uh, you might wanna pick up locally on Craigslist because you'll probably snag a better deal and avoid paying shipping if any is applicable at all. I bought my 20 inch unit a few years ago for around 120, which is not bad considering just how good it looks. Similarly spec monitors with roughly the same PPI cost about the same and while they might be a bit brighter and slimmer, if this is the look you're going for, just go for it. At the end of the day, you are at the very least a proud owner of an iconic retro Apple gadget. As for the setup I put together here, I have everything atop a Vivo standing desk that I got off Amazon last year. And also by the way, I have everything that I've implemented into this setup listed in the video description if you're interested. It's super solid, affordable, can achieve a 120 inch-ish height off the ground and has a great wood grain texture on its surface. They sell bigger desks as well. This unit happens to be 40 by 24. I also happen to own a 55 by 24 from them too, which offers quite a bit more room to spread out. On this smaller desk though, there is a designated cable management area, which I find quite nice. And you know, it'd look even nicer if I actually manage my cables. Meanwhile, flanking the monitor and Mac mini, I have the tried and true Logitech Z200 speakers in black and white. I have like no joke used these speakers in like setups that I put together over the past six years and I've had absolutely zero issues with them. They have great highs, mids, lows, bass, and I'm gonna stop talking because I'm not an audiophile. And by the way, you need to get external audio for your Mac mini because while it does have a functional, you know, built-in speaker, it's like really kind of trash. Flanking the speakers, I have two Hayes Marble Bass Stick Lamps from Project 62. You can find them at Target for around 30 a piece. I recommend ordering them online though because they're never in stock when you go to the retail store in person. As for the other peripherals, I have an RK61 60% mechanical gaming keyboard from RK Clutch. It's super clean, RGB, wired, tactile, and compact. I regularly use its bigger 71 key brother and absolutely love it for typing up assignments, video descriptions, and scripts for videos like this one. I also have the Magic Trackpad 2 connected to take advantage of macOS's amazing gestures. It's definitely a bit pricey, but if you're consistently pinching, zooming, switching desktops, etc., you may want to pick one up, and I'm sure you can find one refurbished or used for under $100. Lastly, I decided to hook up a classic Apple wired mouse to complement the older monitor, which would have been hooked up to something like a Power Mac G5 in its day running Mac OS X Panther. Crazy how time flies. So yeah, if you like what I chose for this setup, I have everything listed in the video description once again, but as for the monitor, there really isn't anything else like it, and I recommend picking one up sooner than later because they're gonna become increasingly rare and more expensive, and eventually, of course, obsolete resolution-wise. And that about wraps things up. I hope this video was helpful and fun. I cannot wait to cover the iPad Pros coming up, and of course, the M1 iMacs that I've touched on in this video, so stay tuned for that. Subscribe for that as well if you're not already, and as always, I'm Noah and I will catch you all in the next one.